the rock and roll. Let's get this. Let's get this rolling. Today is reading four. I think we finished. I love the delay in, in, in the website over here, or at least in my scrolling. Okay. Um, I'm going to look at the third reading, which is for yesterday. And let me do a quick look, see, and make sure. Yes, we covered it. We read about um, the wrestling match. We read about the name change. We spoke about the significance of the different of different names, Jacob, um, Yaakov and Yisrael, Jacob and Israel, struggle versus dominion, right? And how in life we have both personas. We have areas that we struggle with, areas that, if we're being honest, we'll never fully overcome, right? And then we have areas in which, please God, we will, and we've we've mastered. Then we spoke about the the incredible encounter. Well, we spoke about the hip dislocation, right? And why we don't eat the uh, the geranusha, the part of the animal that represents that part of the hip, the the um, sciatic nerve. Then we spoke about the final, the not the final encounter, but the finally the encounter between the two brothers, twin brothers, and they hug it out and kiss it out. But you know, it's a question as to how sincere the kiss was. Either way. This meeting ended without a shot, which was remarkable given the fear that Jacob had. So today, what I'd like to do is do the fourth reading and the fifth reading, because tomorrow we have the uh, the other class, the JLI class, Secrets of the Bible, and then Friday we'll do six and seven. So today, again, the goal is four and five. So let's jump in. We're still at the encounter. The scene is still set. Jacob and Esau. And they're meeting each other for the first time in over 20 years. And everyone's around. Here we go. Je Genesis 33, verse 6. And the maidservants and their children drew near and prostrated themselves. And Leah and her children drew near and prostrated themselves. And after them, Joseph and Rachel drew near and prostrated themselves. Interestingly enough, um, the Torah switches the order. Remember I told you how he, um, his family went in, in different waves? The maidservants went first, and then Leah and her children went first, and then Rachel and Joseph went last, and then he went ahead of everyone else? So he went ahead, and he met with his brother, and they hugged and kissed. But then the waves of the family came. Who was in the last wave? Joseph and Rachel, which we know obviously was his original love and her son. At that point, she only had one son, Joseph. But I want you to look at the order, Joseph and Rachel. And I'm going to go back, turn back time, TBT Wednesday, to let's turn back to the last reading and look at how it's described. You see that? Rachel and Joseph. When he set up the divisions, he put the maidservants and their children, Leah and her children, and Rachel and her child. But when they approach, Rachel first, Joseph last. But when they approach in real time, in today's reading, right, that was yesterday. In today's reading, we see the order is different. The order is first Joseph and then Rachel. You notice that? Originally, the mother was walking in front of the child. The parent was going to protect the child if need be. But when push came to shove, who went first? Joseph. Joseph said, I'm protecting mama. I'm not, I'm not, uh, she's not protecting me. I'm going to stand in front. Here we go. Take a look. Take a look. Joseph and Rachel drew near. In all cases, says Rashi, the mothers drew near before the sons. But in Rachel's case, Joseph preceded her. Again, even though when Jacob positioned them, he positioned Rachel first and then Joseph but Joseph moved out of the line and moved ahead of his mother. And he said, my mother, my mother has a pretty figure. Perhaps that scoundrel, Esau, will set his eyes on her. I will stand in front of her and prevent him from gazing at her. However, whatever, listen, it's a, it, it, it's a very specific context of protection. But the bottom line is, he was protecting his mother. Because of this deed, Joseph merited the blessing. And this blessing was given to Joseph by Jacob on his deathbed, over the eye. 
What is the over the eye blessing? Meaning that he stood up in front of Esau's eyes. What does it mean over the eye? He prevented Esau from looking at Rachel from, from, uh, from having any thoughts about her. So what's the point? The point is Joseph protected his mother. Everyone else, the parent, the mothers went, and then the children. Joseph put himself in front of his mother to protect her. So something nice about Joseph, and eventually he is um, blessed for that action. All right, here we go. Back to our story, back to Esau and Jacob. And he said, and Esau said to Jacob, what is to you the purpose of all this camp that I have met? I love that question. He's like, what's going on? What, what? Let me explain. This camp means the gift. What's the purpose of all the gifts that you've sent me? Remember, he sent them waves and waves of animals, like multiple waves of cattle and sheep and go whatever. I'm just making up animals at this point, but right, waves of different animals. So he says, what's, wh why did you send all this stuff to me? What was the purpose of all that? Jacob answered, to find favor in my master's eyes. In other words, so that you should like me and not hate me and want to kill me. <laughs> and I think it worked also, right? Just don't tell anybody, right? So why did you send it to me? To find favor in my master's eyes. But Esau said, no, no. I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have remain yours. Look at that. Esau says, do me a favor. Do me a favor. I have plenty of stuff. I'm doing well for myself. I'm not lacking anything. You keep what's yours, and that's fine. Thereupon Jacob said, verse 10, no. Sorry, please no. If indeed I have found favor in your eyes, then you shall take my gift from my hand. Because I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of an angel. And you have accepted me. So what we have here is a classic case of people fighting over, you know, it's almost like paying paying the check at the uh, at the restaurant. I'll pay. No, I'll pay. No, I'll pay. No, I'll pay. So Jacob sends a gift, and he says, "says I don't need your gift." He says, "No, take my gift." But look at look at the language that he uses. Please, no. He's he's requesting that he indeed accept the gift. Take my gift. You shall take my gift from my hand. And then because I've seen your face, which is like seeing the face of an angel, and you've accepted me. In other words, he's saying, especially now that we're on good terms, I definitely want you to have a gift to make sure that everything's cool. But there's also the illusion to seeing the face of an angel, which he did see the night before, right? The, the previous night he had wrestled with, according to our tradition, Esau's angel. So he says, I've seen your face, which is like seeing the face of an angel, and you've accepted me. He's also alluding to that epic wrestling match so he continues jacob continues verse 11 now take my gift which has been brought to you for god has favored me with it and because i have everything in other words i have everything i need and i want you to have this gift and ultimately jacob he prevailed upon him his brother and he took it so he convinced him to take the gift and esau accepted the gift But I want to I want to share with you an insight. Jacob says, "Now take my gift." Right? Now take my gift. And and eventually he takes it. Look at the Hebrew. Kach na et birchati. You know what that means in Hebrew? Kach na means please take. S means the or yeah, please take what? Birchasi. What does that mean? What's a bracha? Blessing. A blessing. So notice he doesn't say, take my gift. He says, take my blessing. And with this, some commentators want to say that Jacob was giving back the blessing that he had taken 20 years prior. Jacob had taken the blessing from Esau for material blessings because that was event that, that was intended for, for Esau. And he took the material blessing. At this point, he says to him 20 years later, you know what? Kachnas brachasi. Take, take my blessing. Take the blessing that I got from you. Take it back. Take the gifts. Take the animals. I don't need it. This I'm not giving you an explanation. This explanation that I'm giving you does not work with the way we, we've explained it in Secrets of the Bible in that class, because that explains how, J how Jacob did need both. According to this understanding that I'm sharing with you, 
He gives back the blessing. Esau was meant to be the one who has the material. Jacob was meant to have the spiritual gifts, spiritual blessings. And Jacob took both. Now he's giving one back. He says, you know what? I don't need to be, um, I don't need to be wealthy materialistically. I'm fine having spiritual wealth. That's one perspective. Not the one that we've done in the course that we recently that we're teaching now um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but nonetheless a perspective. I wanted to share that with you. Consider that my birchasi, my gift. I'm kidding. That's uh, that's another perspective. Okay, let's continue. Very interesting dialogue. Thereupon he said, um, "This is. I wish they would have put in brackets who said who who's saying this. This is Esau. Thereupon Esau said to Jacob." Travel and we will go, and I will go alongside you. Essentially, what he's saying is, well, now that we've made up and now that we're friends, let's travel and essentially live together. Let's let's reunite as a family. We're mishpacha. Let's get along. Let's travel together. Let's live in the same vicinity. Jacob says no. Verse thirteen. And Jacob said to him, no. My master, in other words, Esau, knows that the children are tender and the flocks and the cattle which are raising their young depend upon me. And if they overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. Basically, I need to travel more slowly than you. I have young children. I have uh, flocks and cattle which are not going to make it if I push them too hard. So I, I need to travel slowly. You said to me, Let's travel together. And I'm saying to you, I can't. Now he says, Jacob says, rather, let my master go ahead before his servant. You, you go on ahead. And I will move at my own slow pace according to the pace of the work that is before me and according to the pace of the children until one day I come to my master to Seir. Seir is where Esau lived, Mount Seir. So he, he's telling him, you want to travel together? You want to live together? I appreciate the offer, but you know what? Right now, you go ahead and I'll catch up to you. Here's what you need to know. Jacob never caught back up with Esau. He never joined Esau in some sort of you know family sitcom dynamic reality show situation. Never happened. According to the commentaries, what this means is, Seira, until I come to my master in Seir, right, Hebrew-English, that's a reference to the verse that says um, that in the future time, we're going we're gonna to go to the, the mountain of, of Esau and, uh, you know, with the redemption. So what he's alluding to is the fact that he's saying that when Mashiach comes, we'll once again reunite, but not before then. I'm going to pull Rashi's commentary here, and let's uh, let's see what we can find here. Um, okay, one second. Take a look. Take a look. So, first of all, in Jacob's excuse, he talks about the cattle. So, the sheep and the cattle, Rashi says, which are raising their young, depend on me to lead them slowly. So, I can't go with you. I can't go with you. Oh, we have French. Enfantis. Rearing or sideways? Children. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to, uh, again, second verse of the excuse, verse 14. So Jacob says, please do not lengthen the days of your traveling. In other words, don't slow down because of me. Go ahead according to your speed, even if it will distance yourself from me. Don't call me, don't call me, we'll call you, right? No, we'll catch up one day. Never happened. Let's continue. Here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, and, and the conclusion was, until I, I come to my master to say, or we'll meet up once again. So Rashi says, he told him of a longer journey, although he intended to go only as far as Sukkot. In other words, Jacob only intended to settle in a place called Sukkot. That was the name of the place. But Sayer was further. He never intended to meet up with him in Sayer. So why did he say that? So Jacob said to himself, if he intends to harm me, he will wait until I come to him. But he did not go to Sayer. In other words, he wasn't sure yet if it was still a trap. 
if if Esau wanted to lure him into his place and then you know beat him up or whatever harm him over there so he said you know you go to say and I'll meet you there and then he never intended on showing up so Rashi asks rhetorically so when will he go I mean it's sad that can't lie right I mean it you know it doesn't seem nice so he told him he's going to meet up with him so when is he going to go so Rashi answers, and that's what I told you, in the days of Mashiach, in the days of the Messiah, as it is said, and Savior shall ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau. In other words, in this future time, there will be some sort of confluence, some sort of coming together of Zion and Seir, of, of, of Jacob and Esau. And what about the fact that Esau's family were idol worshippers? Yeah. They but maybe I mean, didn't want to cohabitate. And when uh, the Messiah uh, comes, all that goes away. Yes, that's the way I understand it. A hundred percent. Yes, that's exactly the way I understand it. So Rashi points out his concern of, of physical safety. I would say also, and this is really also based on Kabbalah, that Jacob sensed that 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 Esau wasn't ready for that transformation. He wasn't ready. So to, to just go there and 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 not accomplish anything, there's no point. So he says, when you're ready, when the world is ready, when you're ready for transformation, which is essentially the meaning of the Messianic era, when the whole world is transformed into a state of goodness, so then, then we'll meet up once again. And that's, uh, that's essentially what's, what's happening. And there's even a verse from Obadja to, uh, Obadja to, uh, to back it up. Okay, let, let me toggle Rashi off because it sometimes can make it a little bit confusing to read. Let's hide Rashi. Don't worry, Rashi. We still love you. Um, we're just uh, toggling you off. Uh, verse 15. Here we go. The, thereupon Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. <laughs> In other words, if we're meeting up soon, let me leave some, some of my... Remember, he came with 400 men. Let me leave some folks that can help you on your journey until you meet up. But he said, but Jacob said, why do that? May I find favor in my master's eyes? Like, no, no, no need to bother. Again, you and I know that Jacob never intended to meeting up with him. And so why have the pressure of Esau's folks with him? He says, no, 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 no need to, no, no need to send me any, any, any help. I'm, I'm, I'm good. All right. Um, verse 16. So Esau returned on that day on his way to Seir. He went home. And Jacob what did Jacob do? Well, you know, what did, what did he do? You know already based on Rashi, Jacob traveled to Sukkot. We know Sukkot is a holiday, but there was a place called Sukkot also. And he built himself a house. And for his cattle, he made booths. Therefore, he named the place Sukkot. If you're wondering why was it called Sukkot, which means like a hut, because that's what he made for his cattle. Before we had a holiday of Sukkot, Jacob was making Sukkot. He was making... Um, Little huts and booths for his cattle. Anyway, a nice, uh, a nice little um, point of trivia. If you ever, if you ever asked in a in a bar, right, or in a pub, what's the first time? Where's the first mention of Sukkot in the Torah? You know that it's not about the holiday. It's not about the huts after the Exodus. It's Jacob's huts that he built for his animals when on, upon his return to Israel. Okay, and Jacob, here we go. And Jacob came safely after that to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padan Aram, which is where uh, Charon, Padan Aram, where Laban lived, and he encamped before the city. And he brought, sorry, and he bought the part of the field. Ah, again, a purchase in Israel. And he bought the part of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Chamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred kesitas. So basically, here's the second mention of Jewish ownership because of a sale in the land of Israel. We read about the buying of the cave of Machbela in, in Hebron, in Hebron, and now we're reading about the field in Shechem, which today is also known um, in the Arab world as Nablus. It's, um, it, what's interesting is that precisely the places that are depicted in Torah as having clear Jewish ownership those places are precisely the ones that are the most hot, hotly contested in modern times. I mean, uh, Hebron, Hebron is very, uh, it's a very uh, hotbed of, uh, of tension, and also Shechem. Um, so he bought Shechem, then, there he erected an altar, and he named it 
God is the God of Israel. It's an interesting name for an altar, but who am I to judge? All right, God is the God of Israel. Um, by the way, who is Israel? Remember, he was Israel, right? That was his new name, Yisrael. Although the Torah uses Jacob also, but remember, he did have a name change, so that's what he meant. All right, that's the end of the fourth reading. And now the fifth reading is one of the most dramatic and complicated stories in the Torah. And it has to do with Dina, who was the daughter of Leah. Okay, but before we do that, any questions about what we learned about the uh, the conclusion of the meeting between Jacob and Esau? Any questions or comments? What was the, why Israel as the name? What was, what, what specifically was the translation or meaning that he wanted to, that was wanted to be ascribed to Jacob? Oh, you're saying why, when he constructed the monument, did he not want to call it the God of Jacob? As opposed no, to when, when Jacob got the second name of Israel. Oh. So Jacob means heal, heal. Which, which connotes somebody who's like struggling and wrestling and grappling and, and, and bothered. You know, it's like uh, tumultuous. And then you have the name Yisrael, which is Sar Kel, which means a minister of God. And so it connotes the idea of spiritual mastery. So there's the struggle and the mastery, two different personas. And like I said, I think I mentioned it yesterday and, and, and earlier, I even just dropped it very quickly earlier today. Each of us has these two qualities within us. There are areas in which we struggle and areas in which we have mastery. You know, there's certain things that other people are tempted with where for us, it's not a challenge. It's like that other person has a temptation. For me, it's easy. In that area, that's our Yisrael. That's our name Yisrael in that area. But there are other areas that maybe the other guy doesn't struggle, but we struggle with. That's our Jacob. That's our Yaakov. So we each have the two, and that's why the Torah uses both terms. Okay, now we get into the Dina drama. Ari, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, for sure, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, um, this is about uh, Jacob saying he was going to Seir, but he's really going yes. to Sukkot. Yes. Um, and it said, I've got a note here. It says, the Midrash asked this. Uh, for Jacob would not have told Esau that he would come to Mount Seir if it were not true. But Jacob had no trouble lying and misleading. It's how he got the birthright. So why is that comment made? You're saying, why Why even the question? This is his MO, yeah. right? He took the blessings. He, you know, de deceived Laban and left in the middle of the night. And now he's telling Esau that he's going to meet him and he has no intention of meeting him. Exactly. This is this is classic Jacob. Jacob being Jacob. That's your question. Yeah. Okay. The question is based on a different reading of all of those stories, right? He took the blessings because of this justification. He left Esau. He left Laban in the middle of the night with his family for that reason. So when he tells Esau that he's going to meet up with him and doesn't, we have to have another reason. So again, it's the question is how. I'm going to use the word cynical or how um, literal maybe do we want to read the Jacob story versus how much a, a better phrase, how much benefit of the doubt do we want to give to Jacob or not? So if we, if we give him all the benefit of the doubt, then we have to do that here also, which is what the Medrash is talking about. If we say, look, it's Jacob, come on. Well, then that doesn't, you're right. Then that doesn't, it's, it's not a question. Of course he told him something misleading, right? But again, the, the way classically our sages understood it is that there's a positive or there's a justification to, you know, every step of the way. But you listen, you, you, you and I have the, have the ability as we read it to come to our conclusions. I mean, that's it. But where is the measures coming from? From a place of, of, of understanding his actions for the positive and, and in a symbolic way. So what's the symbolism? Mashiach. All right. But good question. So, all right, fifth reading, the Dina drama. Let's do this. Well, um, I don't know that we're going to finish it, but let's definitely start it. It's a bit of a long reading. Dina, remember, Dina was child number seven, born to Leah. And Leah prayed that instead of having another boy, which would then mean that her sister Rachel would only have one, she prayed that it be a girl, which it was, so that her sister could have two boys. That, that's just the way the story is told. So Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, just in case you forgot who Dina was, but we have a bit of a bio. So she went out to look among, to, sorry, she went out to look about among the daughters of the land. 
So remember, they're living in Shechem. They're living in that part of town or that part of the land of Israel, Canaan. Jacob had bought a piece of the land in that area. And so she goes out. She goes out to um, see what's going on. And Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Chivi, the, the Hivite, so the, the city was named after him. Right? This Hamar guy was very wealthy and powerful. He had a son, Shechem. He named the city after his son. So the namesake of the city, he was the prince. Prince Shechem. Oh, it says it right here. Look at that. I'm like telling you information, but it's literally right here. Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw Dina. And he took her, lay with her, and violated her. The way we understand this is that he raped her. And, and the commentators point out that there's two expressions, lay with her and violated her, which means, uh, without, getting without getting into details, various forms of, of sexual assault. Okay? Um, and the verse continues, the Torah continues, his soul cleaved to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the girl and spoke to the girl's heart. So he assaulted her, but then he fell in love with her. And he wanted to marry her. And Shechem, are you with me so far in the story? Yes? Okay. Verse 4. And Shechem, the prince, spoke to his father, Hamar, the big macher, saying, take this girl for me as a wife. Now, Jacob had heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dina. Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter. But his sons were with his livestock in the field. And Jacob kept silent until they came home. Okay. Are you, I mean, it's just, the, here we, the Torah is piecing together the story for us. Verse 6. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. So now the two fathers are conversing. You see what's going on here? Right? So Shechem rapes Dina, falls in love with her at that point, wants to marry her, tells his dad. Her dad finds out. His dad now goes over to her dad's house for a meeting. Basically saying, my son wants to marry your daughter. And Jacob's sons at that point had come from the field when they heard. So basically they heard not just, oh, Shechem wants to marry our sister Dina. They heard what happened. And the men were grieved. And they burned fiercely. We talk about different reactions to trauma, right? They grieved for their sister. And they burned fiercely. They were angry. Because he had committed a scandalous act in Israel to lie with the daughter of Jacob, and such ought not to be done. Assault, they assaulted, he assaulted their sister. And Hamar spoke with them. But I, I love, I love that, I love that line. Such ought not to be done. You don't, you don't do that. Not with our family. Not, not, not to say that someone else is fine, but definitely not here. So, so now you have, again, you have the fathers having a, sh a conversation, but the brothers, her brothers know about this. And Hamar spoke with them saying, my son Shechem, his, his soul has a liking for your daughter. Please give her to him for a wife and intermarry with us. You shall give us, and I was, don't limit it to this, Shirach, to this match. You shall give us your daughters and you shall take our daughters for yourselves. And you shall dwell with us. And the land shall be before you. Remain, do business there, and settle there. In other words, let's all be one happy family. Let's, yeah, let's let the past about how this relationship got started. Let's forget about that. Let's all be friends, and let's all be family. And Shem said to, okay, Shem is now the, the young man, the prince, who violated Dina. Shem said to her father, said to Jacob, and to her brothers, right, the brothers, 
may I find favor in your eyes. Now you have, so that until now was the father speaking. Now you have the son himself, the young man himself. By now you should know he's in trouble, right? At this point, you should know that he's in trouble, right? This is not going to end well, okay? But let's read the story. He says, may I find favor in your eyes? Um, whatever you tell me, I will give. Impose upon me a large marriage settlement and gifts, and I will give as much as you ask of me, but give me the girl for a, for a wife. I'll give you whatever you want. Just give her to me in marriage. You ready? Here we go. This is where the story gets very interesting. So thereupon Jacob's sons answered Shem and his father Hamar with cunning. Okay, speaking about deception, here's deception right now. And they spoke because after all, he had to file their sister Dina. In other words, in other words, with all of the overtures of peace and love and family and friendship and, and money and everything that's being thrown at them, at the end of the day, he had raped their sister. So now they're plotting revenge and now they have a plan. And they said to them, father and son, Hamar and Shechem, we cannot do this thing to give our, our sister to a man who has a foreskin, for that is a disgrace to us. But with this, however, we will consent to you. If you will be like us, that every male will be circumcised. So what do they say? They say, yes, we will agree to this marriage, to this match, on condition that you have a bris, that you have a circumcision. Then we will give you our daughters and we will take your daughters for ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. Mark, if you had a problem with deception up until now, this is the most deceptive thing we've encountered so far. They are literally saying that we are prepared to completely get involved and be one and be family and Thanksgiving to get no problem. All you need to do is bris everybody, right? Just, just, Brisk the whole area. Every male should have a circumcision so that we can all marry each other. But, but if not, if you do not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go, no deal. No circumcision, no deal. You know, like in the stores, no shoes, no shirt, no service, no circumcision, no shidduch, not happening. That's all they want? A bit of a medical procedure? No money? No, no big dowry? No problem. Their words pleased Hamar and Shechem, the son of Hamar. Well, Hamar and his son Shechem, they were so happy to hear. They were thrilled. All we need to do is a bris, and, 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 and that's it. Best news ever. And the young man, Shechem, did not delay to do the thing because he desired Jacob's daughter. He right away. And he was the most honored in all his father's household. So right away, he did the bris. Oh, well, he began working on the bris. Here's how it plays out. And Hamar and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city. Remember, they were the, the heads of the city. The city was named after the guy, after all, the kid. And they spoke to the people of the city saying, now they're trying to understand what's going on here. Now they have to convince everybody in the city to do a circumcision. They're not in love with Dina, but now they have to convince everybody to do this. All right. These men are peaceful with us. And they, well, so they thought. And they will dwell in the land and do business there. And the land, behold, it is spacious enough for them. We will take their daughters for ourselves as wives, and we will give them our daughters. However, only with this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to become one people. And that is by every male among us being circumcised, just as they are circumcised. Then shall not their cattle, their property, and all their beasts be ours, but let us consent to them and they will dwell with us. With that line, we see that he's presenting it in a way of a bit of deviousness to get buy-in from his people, right? His constituency. He says, guys, what's in it for us? We can rip them up. Once, once we're in, once they're in, ugh, we're going to take all their stuff. So let's do it. Let's All they're asking is circumcision. Let's do it. Well... You can probably guess what happened next, verse 24. And all those coming out to the gate of the city of his city listened to Hamar and his son Shrem, and every male, all who went out of the gate of his city, in other words, anyone who lived in that town, became circumcised.
Yep. Now it came to pass on the third day. Remember, the third day is the day that the angels visited Abram after his circumcision, because as our sages tell us, it's the day that after a procedure that one is in the most pain and it's the most difficult. So it was the third day when they were in the greatest pain. I added the word the greatest. That when they were in pain, that Jacob's two sons, Shimon and Levi, Dina's brothers, each took his sword and they came upon the city with confidence and they slew every male. Now you're going to ask me about collective punishment and reprisals and, 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 and whatever. It's all been asked. It's a very good question. What gave them the right to kill every male? Maybe Shem, maybe Hamar, but why every male? And the understanding is that everybody ultimately in the city, since there was no justice, then everybody is complicit on some level, and they felt that they could take justice. The Shimon and Levi felt that they needed to take justice in their own hands. And Hamar and his son Shechem, they slew with the edge of the sword, and they took Dina out of Shechem's house and left. You know what this implies? That she was being held captive in Shechem's house. He had assaulted her and then kept her. They took her out and they left. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and plundered the city that had defiled their sister. They are not messing around. Their flocks and their cattle and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and whatever was in the field they took and all their wealth and all their infants and their wives, they captured and plundered and all that was in the house. I don't know exactly what that means with the infants and the wives, what, what, what they actually did. I'm assuming they didn't do anything untoward, but bottom line is they, um, they vengeance, they took vengeance upon the city. Now, that's what they did, Shimon and Levi. Here's the aftermath, there, verse 30. Thereupon, Jacob said to Shimon and Levi, you have troubled me to discredit me among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites, among the Prezites, and I am few in number, and they will gather against me and attack me, and I and my household will be destroyed. What was he telling them? Why'd you do that? You put a big target on our back. You went too far, Shimon and Levi. And they said back to him, shall he make our sister like a harlot? And that's the way the story ends. That's the way the story ends. He says, how could you? And they said, how could we not? That's how the story ends. Again, I told you it's one of the most dramatic stories. It's, 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 I don't know how to describe it other than dramatic. Dramatic doesn't do justice to it. It's a very complicated story. It raises a ton of questions. But I want you to know one thing. To the end of his life, Jacob was upset with Shimon and Levi. At his, uh, on his deathbed, on Jacob's deathbed, he rebukes Shimon and Levi for doing what they did. I feel like I want to share this with you. So let me stop sharing my screen. I'm going to browse. Oh, my computer freezing now. What's going on here? All right. My apologies. My uh, computer is not uh, is not responding as well as I would like it to be. But let me quickly. I know I know it's a little bit late, but I want if you if you will please indulge me. I want to pull up the last the final words of Jacob to these two sons. Give me a moment. My computer is running a little bit slow. Not sure what's bogging it down, but something apparently is, uh, is slowing it down. Um, a second. Okay, here we go. Yes. Wow. This is. Um, it's strong, strong words, strong words that I'm going to share with you now. Tell me if you can see my screen. Is it working? Yes. Okay, here we go. This is, I, I just want to give you context, how Jacob never forgot what his sons did. His sons felt justified, but he never forgot what they did. This is the end of his life, the, the, last, the last portion, last chapter in, uh, in Genesis. 
Jacob called for his sons and said, gather, and I will tell you what will happen at the end of the days. He, he goes to his, uh, his sons, Reuben, this, fine. Sh S Simeon and Levi are brothers. He groups them together. Stolen instruments are their weapons. You see that? They snuck and, this, and without telling him, and they, they stole away to, to harm the, the, the Shem and destroy the city. Let my soul not enter their council. Look at that. I don't want to be a part of their schemes. My honor, you shall not join their assembly. For in their wrath, they killed a man. And with their will, they hamstrung a bull. Cursed be their wrath, for it is mighty. And their anger, because it is harsh. I will separate them throughout Jacob, and I will scatter them throughout Israel. That's very harsh. You see what's going on? You understand what, what Jacob is saying? When they banded together... They ended up committing acts of violence. Jacob to his deathbed, to his very last day on, on this earth, was unhappy with what they did. And he said, therefore, I will separate them because when they're together, it's dangerous. By the way, you know who else knew that? Joseph. When the brothers came, I mentioned this in one of the classes recently, when Joseph's brothers came down to buy food in Egypt, when there was the famine, the first thing Joseph did was he imprisoned Shimon, Simeon, because he wanted to keep Simeon and Levi, those two, away from each other. Because when they're together, it's, uh, it can be very dangerous for anybody else that gets in the way. Um, but the words, of, the words of the brothers in response to Jacob's concerns, Jacob says, the optics aren't good. We live amongst people. They were put, putting a target on our backs. This is not good for the Jews, right? Hachzona. Uh, I forget the words in Hebrew. Should our sister be made like a harlot? Should she be abused and treated like, uh, like, like, like she's, not, she's not a human being? What is this? I need to tell you one more thing. And this is the final thing I'm going to say about this. Today, at least. Um, we learn a very interesting Jewish milestone from this story. And this may catch you by surprise. The source in Torah for Bar Mitzvah, Bar Mitzvah, being 13, is from this story. Why? So actually, I'm going to share my screen with you once again. Um, okay, here we go. Sharing my screen. This is the last thing that I'm going to point out. And then I'm going to, I'm going to let you all go. Um, when it talks about Shimon and Levi wiping out the city. It says, verse 25. On the third day, when the people were in pain and couldn't defend themselves, Jacob's two sons, Shimon and Le Simeon and Levi, and his brothers, each took his sword. But in the Hebrew, it says, Shimon and Levi achedina, ish Charbo. Each man took his sword. He used the word ish. In Hebrew, ish means a man. And our sages, based on the how old they were, our sages underst understood that Shimon and Levi were 13. And they were called ish. They were called men. If you want to know the source of bar mitzvah, 13, being a man in Jewish law, in, in the Jewish uh, perspective, why that's a thing, where that comes from, it comes from this story. Ish charbo. Each man took his sword. There's a word missing here. Each man took his sword. They were 13. And they were all considered men. Now, how were they 13? How were they 13 at that time? That's a good question. I mean, we have to look at... Um, I don't know what I just did. Okay, let me stop sharing. Um, we would have to look at the timeline. They were both within the same year. They weren't twins. So one was early 13, one was late 13, but they were both 13. That becomes the, the, the age of bar mitzvah without getting into the specifics of what they did. The message for a bar mitzvah boy is when you're bar mitzvah, now it's time to step up, not the specifics. Remember, no one tells a bar mitzvah boy, here's a fountain pen, find somebody that needs a little bit of a zetz and no, God forbid, right? No violence, right? But what we can learn is 
the idea of seeing injustice and not being silent, seeing a wrong and taking action, defending the one who no one else is defending. These are qualities that do define a certain degree of maturity and define what it means to be bar or bat mitzvah. So in conclusion, I wanted to point out that we learned the notion of bar mitzvah from this story, which on some level is somewhat troubling. Look, it's troubling what happened to Dina. One could argue, as Jacob himself did, it's troubling what they did in response. But either way, they did something. To not do anything would be tantamount to being part of the problem when you're bar mitzvah, when you're an adult, it's time to no longer be part of the problem, be part of the solution. Again, <laughs> no, bar, no rabbi is advocating that a bar, or parent is advocating that a bar mitzvah boy actually turn to, uh, to such, uh, such actual conduct. But nonetheless, the spirit, again, we have to strip it away from its little um, parameters. The spirit of what they did is certainly fitting with the spirit of what it means to be mature. All right, Take, uh, yeah. yeah, something occurs to me. This is not the this is not the only time uh, the Levites took a sword and mm. destroyed everyone everyone who, who committed who committed a crime a horrible crime. Yes. They did the same thing as you know with uh, the children of Israel who worshipped the golden calf. They took a sword. They took swords and they sl they, sl sl they slew them all. Correct. Now the question in my own mind is Jacob. Did Jacob at that point have the gift of prophecy to see that the descendants of Levi would in fact kill his descendants for wrong? It's a crazy conclusion. It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting point. Well, first of all, let me, let me explain what you're saying. Years later, hundreds of years later, right? So this is before. Years later, there will be an exodus and there will be a Torah giving at Sinai, and there will be a sin of the golden calf. And then Moses comes down the mountain, and essentially Moses does ask God for forgiveness, and most of the people are forgiven, but the people directly involved with the building and worshiping the golden calf, like the core, the core group, they were put to death for idol worship. And Moses essentially says what the Maccabees would say later, thousands of years later in history, me la Hashem elai, who is unto God, come to me. Right? Who is who's on God's side? Come to me. And the entire tribe of Levi came to him. And, and Moses said, we need to, uh, to, to, to apply capital punishment to those that were directly involved with it. And they did. So you're right. Levi, later on in history, the tribe at least, is also the one that uh, kind of um, takes vengeance or executes justice, however you want to look at it. Right against the some of the worshippers of the golden calf. Interesting. Did Jacob have prophecy? One hundred percent. On his deathbed, one hundred percent. Everything that he said to the tribes, to his sons, sorry, to his sons, was prophetic and and came to pass. What's interesting, what I find also interesting and compelling is that the, that Levi is the, is the Levites. M um, Mark, yeah. I happen to know a Levite, <laughs> and you're a Levite. Yeah. So first of all, Mark is a Levite, which means that no one should mess with Mark. Because Mark, we know Mark is a peaceful guy, but one thing is for sure, don't get on his bad side because he's a Levite. No, but what I find interesting is that, that from the tribe of Levi, where the, we, we associate the Levites and the, and the priests that are also Levites from the same family with love and kindness and generosity and that sort of thing, which is interesting. I guess, uh, you know, I don't know. It's... I don't know that I have an answer or, you know, other than to say it's an interesting thing to think about and to ponder as we wrap up Daily Power Parsha on this lovely Wednesday. All right. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, I will let you Mark, go. Ahead. Mark, Mark the Levite, we miss you in Shul. <laughs> Mark the Levite. <laughs> yeah. Mark the uh, Levite. Yeah, I was, I was always disturbed by, uh, you know, the Talmud saying that if you violate a woman, you have to marry her. And I was like, who, what woman would want to marry her rapist? Excellent but question. And it was, first of all, two things. Number one, she, the obligation wasn't on her, it was on him. And to understand this, we have yeah. to understand the history. Back in the day, I, I, what, I'm not telling you any, I'm not, I'm not giving you my feelings on the matter. 
I'm just telling you the way the world worked then. The way the world worked then is that essentially a woman needed a man to survive. I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you what life was like 3,500 years ago. And what I'm also telling you is, and this is a fact well documented, that somebody who was raped was considered to not be desirable for someone to, for, for men to marry. I'm not justifying it. I'm telling you what's going on. So what the Torah is saying is you cannot violate someone and then leave them without an option. So you now have to take responsibility for her. Now, if she says, are you kidding me? Of course she can object to it. Should she object to it? If you're asking my opinion, yes. Would she object to it? I'm going to think yes, but I know that I can't in 2020 put my brain in. First of all, I can't put my. Even in 2020, I can only put my brain where it is sitting in my head with my through my eyes. I can't. I don't. I know I don't have a perspective of anyone else, let alone another gender. So that's number one. Let alone, I know that I have no perspective in my head in 2020 on what a woman living 3,500 years ago, how she would have felt about in the aftermath of, of this type of assault or, or not this type of, 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 of an assault. Would she feel like it's a double punishment that she's She's been assaulted, and now no one's going to marry her. And now not only was she violated, but her future is ruined. And now this is gifting her at least the possibility, if she chooses, of a future. So I, there's a one way to look at it, which is the way it's classically understood, is that it was giving her an option. If she chose, no one is forced to No, never in Jewish law is a woman forced to marry anybody that she doesn't want to marry. There's no concept of having to marry somebody against your will. It's not, it doesn't exist. The Talmud says you cannot marry someone without seeing them because they always have the have to have the option to say, I don't want. So remember when Rebecca was getting married and they said, let's ask the girl. There has to be consent. So just because the Torah says he has to marry her doesn't mean she has to marry him. The Torah is saying is he can't just run away and leave her without an option. Now you're telling me that, that it's a horrible option. It's a horrific option. Who would take that option? I don't know. I, I have the same, I can understand that, 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 that perspective of like, who would ever take that option? But if 3,500 years ago, that was the better of the two evils, who am I to say that that wasn't? I don't know. The Torah is at least making him responsible to, to, to help her. You assaulted her, don't assault her again by running away. I, I don't know if that if that if that frames it a little bit better. But he fell in love with her. I mean, so maybe deep down he had some, you know, he loved her before. No, no, what's yes, but that's the specific case. But Sandrine was asking in general. The Torah says in general, if somebody sexually rapes a woman in general yes yes then they 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 have to marry her and what i'm saying mm -hmm. is the torah doesn't I mean, it's still a law i mean i mean it's still a you know now i'm glad now i, I read more that it's with the woman consent but it's the still a, a the, jewish law no yeah but the torah doesn't say that she has to marry him the torah mm -hmm. says that he yeah if she wants, if she needs that, then he has to be there for her. He can't. He can't abuse her twice. What? Yeah. Again, I understand that 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 anything on this topic sounds completely like we're thinking in 2020. You know what should be done to the guy? Lock him up, and maybe throw away the key. That's what should be done. But what I'm saying is 3,500 years ago, the world was, was, was a very different place. And the question is, what's actually more compassionate for her if she chooses? I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, I, mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I, it's a good question. This is the way that I've seen it being kind of 
contextualized? Does it sit 100% in me? No. Is this, do, do I understand that there might be another way to look at it that in ancient times? Yes. But I'm just giving you a perspective. Whether or not you like it, you know, whether or not it's 100% satisfactory, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I can't say that, but it's a perspective. But, but, yeah. Ari, based upon what Rashi says, it's even worse though, because it <laughs> says uh, he lay with her and this is in a natural manner and violated her. That means in an unnatural manner. I mentioned and that, then, I alluded to that before, yeah. He is, then he wants to marry her and, and she should want that. You know, it's it's in one of the notes here, it says from Gracious Rabbah, is that one of the sins for which God destroyed the world at the time of the flood was sexual immorality. So right. they deserve to be destroyed. Exactly, right. But again, what 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 I think Sandrine was 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 citing is is a situation where, and the, again, the way it's contextualized is, well, what happens if if an assault happens? And in ancient times, at this point, now no one's gonna marry. Let's just say I'm giving you a scenario. No one's gonna marry her, and she says, okay, so now so now how do I fend for my like now what? So what what does my life look like now? I'd rather be with someone, even this guy, than not be. I'm not, I, I feel like, you know, anything that I can say on this sounds, you know, ridiculous. And again, on some level, I, I get that. Not on some level, on, men, on every level, I get that. But I can also understand that the world looked very different. And, and, and somebody might say, you know what? I mean, I like also what I read in uh, Rabadadog. They say that um, you know, the, a man knowing that if he does that, not only he would have you know punishment, but need have to marry her, have to support her all his life, cannot divorce her, might you know be uh, okay. I want that might to be try. enough to dissuade him. Okay, Maybe, so there uh, you go. Uh, <laughs> oh, so so it's um it's a no preventative. I mean, as a um, yeah. It's scare scaring him off. Okay, that's a you know what honestly, <laughs> that's a pretty good perspective. Also, that's a pretty good perspective. Yeah. Anyway, listen. There's more to talk about. You know, even the way we think about it in modern times. You know, if you think about someone who assaults someone and you know and gets her pregnant. You know, would you say that um, if she, you know, and, and, and there's a child born, what would he need to do child support? Would that be right? That's the least he could do, right? The least he could do. What I'm saying is, it's, I understand there's more involved, but on some level, it's at least there's somewhat of a similarity. You have to support her now. You have to support her. I understand now we're talking about marriage and relationships and intimacy and love. And I get that. And I, I, I don't have my brain wrapped around that either. Um, we're on the same page here. Trust me. Trust me. I don't have any, you know, weird, you know, notions of, you know, I, I, I don't. I under, I'm understanding this from a support perspective. Just like we could wrap our hands, even wrap our heads around in 2020. Somebody, God forbid, God forbid, right, assault someone. Yeah, they're going to be on the hook now for support also. I, I, I'm understanding this in a similar way. Now, listen, it's easier to say what Sandrine said, which is like, okay, so this was only said to scare off any potential uh, assault, so it shouldn't happen. I'm, I'm ready to go with that one. Honestly, I'm ready to go with that one, that it was about prevented, pre preventing it from happening. To me, that makes sense. All right, good. We're way past the time, and uh, I, I'm sure everyone's got stuff to do, so... Have a wonderful day. It's great to see you all. And um, tomorrow, uh, sorry, tonight is Torah Studies, 730. Join us for that as we explore the daily, not the daily, the weekly power show. We have a really great class tonight. It's about um, the upcoming Hasidic holiday of the 19th of Kislev. And then tomorrow we have the JLI. More information will go out about that soon. And then we will roll on for the rest of the week. Yes, hold is on. Tomorrow, is tomorrow in person? Tomorrow, it's stay tuned for email on that. Stay tuned. All right, good. We'll see you all. Have Thank a you. wonderful day.
Thank okay. you. All right. Bye.